Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bashir Tawuli. Uh, Dr. Bashir Tawuli is a professor of radiology and the medicine in the abdominal imaging body MR section in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Institute at ICON School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Dr. Tawuli is the director of body MRI and cancer imaging in, in the Department of, uh, Department of Radiology. He's a co-chief of the abdominal imaging section and the vice chair for translational research in the Department of Radiology. Dr. Bashir Taoli has extensive experience in body MR and has been successfully NIH funded since 2010. He has authored over 200 peer review manuscripts and book chapters primarily on body MRI and lectured throughout the world on advanced body MR techniques. I've seen him in too many of these conferences. Uh, Dr. Taoli has been named Distinguished Investigator of the Academy of Radiology Research in 2016. He's a Fellow of International Society of Magnetic Resonance in medicine and uh, that's in 2018 and he's the fellow of international cancer imaging society in 2018 is the chair of mr track refresher course at rsne radiological society of north america dr toll is also a member of uh, numerous societies and he's a fellow of the society of abdominal radiology european society of radiology american association of study of liver disease corresponding fellow of the European Society of Gastrointestinal and Abdominal Radiology, International Liver Cancer Association, and the International Cancer Imaging Society. He was the Associate Editor of American Journal of Radiology. And um, if I keep introducing Dr. Tawoli, then it will take the entire afternoon. So without further ado, I'd like to invite him to speak on the review of chest CT manifestations of COVID-19 infection. Bashir? Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you, uh, uh, Khaled, for organizing uh, a course such uh, quickly. And uh, this is really obviously a hot topic. And, uh, you know, and I would like also to thank the uh, previous speakers, Nicola and uh, Keith, for their uh, very insightful uh, information and as you know the information is changing every day so uh, you need to keep you know um, keep looking at the uh, at the publications and all the uh, different clinical manifestations and treatments uh, and diagnosis for COVID-19. So it's my pleasure to describe the chest CT uh, manifestations of COVID-19 infection. Um, I'd like to show my disclosures to start. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge um, my colleagues in uh, the cardiothoracic uh, imaging section at Mount Sinai who helped me with the slides and provide some cases, uh, Dr. Adam Bernheim and Dr. Michael Chung particularly, who have been really pioneering the description of the findings uh, of COVID-19. So I'm not going to talk much about the, you know, epidemiology and, uh, you know, kind of clinical presentation. It's been really well covered already. Uh, just want to show that this is really good dashboard for people to know. Uh, this is the John Hopkins uh, you know, dashboard that's animated, uh, that's updated on a daily basis, I believe. So you can see here that um, the hotspots are obviously are in, we're in China, but now they moved to Europe back in February, March, Italy, Spain, and then France, UK, and obviously the US uh, became a hotspot very quickly. Uh, first in uh, Seattle, and then New York became a really hotspot that really spread out, and uh, we were in the middle of the, the epicenter um, of the US for a long period of time, we still are. Just to give you an idea, so over 3 million cases confirmed, this was a few days back, over 1 million three in the U.S., over 70,000 uh, deaths in the U.S. That's up and counting. Uh, at Mount Sinai Health System, which is composed of about five to six hospitals across New York City, at one point we had almost 2,000 cases with COVID-19 hospitalized and over, I think, five or 600 cases in the ICU. Um, currently, like the last few days, the numbers are dropped significantly to 664 cases in the hospital. A lot of them have been discharged. 
there have been, of course, some mortality and deaths. Um, and we have, we still have about 185 patients in ICU. So obviously it's contracting. We're really on the other side of the curve, which is a good thing, but there's still a lot of challenges uh, ahead uh, with this disease. This is just a, a map of the US and you can see again, hotspots in the Northeast, New York City, and also some other cities like, you know, in the South in Atlanta and Texas, uh, Chicago. Uh, California has been kind of really, they started early doing a lot of social distancing measures and, you know, shelter uh, in place orders, even before this. So a lot of cases they have been quite successful with that. And same thing in Seattle also, they've been really quite successful as well. Um, so I just want to just delve into, you know, the subject uh, of the matter here, which is imaging findings, mostly looking at chest findings. So first, you know, modality you can look at would be, of course, uh, chest x-ray. Uh, it's better to use portable x-ray. Obviously, it's better. Uh, you know, at Mount Sinai, we had, you know, tents across the street in Central Park uh, with about 25 beds, and we deployed, you know, portable x-ray immediately with these patients. Um, so typically, the most common finding is going to be uh, opacification, uh, often with the peripheral uh, distribution. Um, and uh, at one point, about 70% of patients were requiring hospitalization. We have an abnormal chest X-ray uh, uh, at some of you know uh, hospitalization. But however, uh, when you look at the whole spectrum of patients, uh, some with mild disease may may have normal or negative X-ray despite uh, positive findings on a chest CT. So just, just uh, an example, this is a 25 year old female uh, presenting to the ED at Mount Sinai with seven days of fever, shortness of breath. She was you know, subsequently diagnosed with COVID-19 based on RT-PCR. The chest X-ray was completely negative, normal. However, you can see uh, she had on the chest CT done you know, within a day, uh, multiple areas of uh, round ground glass opacity, at the periphery and posterior areas of the lung that's typical uh, for COVID-19 infection. Uh, typical findings uh, in chest CT include, again, bilateral peripheral, patchy, ground glass opacities with or without consolidation. These ground glass opacities may have a round morphology that's quite typical. Peripheral, again, um, posterior aspect of the lungs uh, lower lobes as well, more frequently involved. So these are some uh, typical findings. This is a, a patient with uh, typical, sorry, uh, with typical COVID-19 infection. You can see bilateral. This is a little more predominant to the left. Um, Round left opacity combined with uh, consolidation. This is also quite typical for um, COVID-19 infection. This is uh, another example. 37 year old male with fever, cough, and dyspnea for seven days, also due to COVID 19. And you can see again this bilateral uh, ground glass opacities, uh, kind of rounded in appearance, and both lungs also highly suggestive of uh, COVID 19 in the appropriate context. Additional findings described on chest CT, uh, there have been also descriptions of crazy. A paving pattern, which is basically involves interlobular septal thickening, as shown in the in the picture here uh, at the bottom. You can see. Uh, I'm sorry, no, this is not a picture. This is different. Uh, this is reverse halo sign. So I'll show you an example of crazy pattern. I show on the next slide. This is an example of a 60 year old male with fever again and symptoms for seven days. This is again ground glass opacity, but you have this kind of you know, reticulation in the peripheral areas of the lung. This is typical for what we call a crazy uh, paving pattern, which is also, uh, you know, highly uh, suspicious for COVID-19 infection. Uh, there have been also descriptions. Um, I just want to say, by the way, I forgot to mention initially that most descriptions have been uh, have been coming from Chinese series. There's enormous literature from China describing chest X-ray and mostly chest CT findings. There's very few papers from Italy, very little from, from the US, it's starting now, but most of the description is really coming from the uh, from China. So there have been also a few papers describing vascular enlargement in areas of uh, affected lungs, uh, bronchograms, also reverse halo sign, which is sometimes described as shown here, when you see this consolidation surrounding areas of you know bronchogram or air, and what's interesting also 
uh, which is really kind of mysterious, is that there's very little description of enlarged lymph nodes uh, in COVID-19. It's unclear why, because the immune system is highly activated, but it's kind of mysterious uh, reason. Uh, there's very also, um, you know, rarely described pleural involvement like uh, fusion and thickening, nodules and pulmonary cavitation is also rarely described. I showed you already this case of a uh, uh, crazy paving pattern. So beyond, you know, diagnosing somebody to confirm the diagnosis of COVID-19 or initial diagnosis, there is also potential for chest CT to uh, provide some kind of severity score, obviously, by looking at the, you know, the extent of disease. Uh, it's important to note that in early disease, uh, chest CT can be negative. When you're really scanning patients too early, uh, it's been described, for instance, in this series in China, that they can be negative. And also, in mild cases, you can have also mostly either ground glass opacity alone. And if you follow patients over time, you can get consolidation. I just want to mention also that the Chinese series have been describing a lot of follow-up, uh, almost like daily CT scan follow-up in these patients, something we rarely do uh, in the U.S., and especially in our hospital, where, first of all, chest CT is rarely performed unless you suspect a complication. We'll discuss this later. But we really rarely do, you know, follow-up CTs on a regular basis uh, in these patients. When you have severe cases, you can have diffuse, you know, uh, involvement of the lungs of the all five segments in kind of a ARDS uh, a clinical picture, which is really usually severe prognosis. I'll show you an example. Uh, actually, I can show, probably show the example um, here. This is an example of a 65-year-old female presented again with, you know, respiratory symptoms. This is the initial presentation um, where you can see some patchy bilateral areas of opacity in the chest x-ray with, with uh, corresponding uh, ground glass opacity and consolidation on the chest CT on the, on the top. This is the initial, but after two weeks, uh, patient uh, condition worsened uh, as Pete Siegel was describing. Sometimes patients takes about a week to start needing more oxygen and having more symptoms. You can see worsening and this is almost like an ERDS type picture where these patients generally require um, mechanical ventilation. Uh, I just want to go back to describing also, uh, a few papers have described uh, stages of disease. Uh, if you follow uh, patients over time in a, you know, uh, let's say, a, you know, a time interval time window of like two weeks, initially, uh, first two days, it can be negative CT, but some other patients will have some uh, ground glass opacity and consolidation. When you wait a few days, between three to five days, the positive rate of uh, ground glass opacity and consolidation goes up. We still have a small number of patients with negative CT. So bottom line, a negative CT does not exclude COVID-19. That's really important to, to remember this. Uh, late phase, six to 12 days, most patients will have a positive CT uh, as described before. And if you wait over two weeks, we call this absorption stage where there's kind of healing going on and sometimes scarring. You can have still some residual ground glass capacity. There's sometimes actually a delay between the clinical symptoms and the chest CT findings, pretty much like you do for, uh, for a regular bacterial pneumonia where you can have a delay between the imaging and the clinical symptoms. And there's not enough data, but it's been described that sometimes patients may, may have some fibrous you know, findings uh, in the kind of midterm, and we need we need really more data on describing sequela of uh, infection in the lungs. This is described uh, based on a paper by my colleague uh, Adam Bernheim uh, Monsanai, who uh, described the uh, chest CT findings based on the time course. This is published in Radiology, uh, and you can see that early on in blue. Uh, chest CT can be normal and negative. Uh, you can have some uh, degree of consolidation, uh, bilateral disease, peripheral distribution. But what's interesting is that in uh, intermediate, you get more consolidation, obviously more bilateral, more peripheral. And in late uh, stage, uh, most patients will have still some, uh, you know, findings going on in the, in the chest with the interesting finding of linear opacities 
that are more frequent uh, in these patients. 20% of patients will have some, some linear opacities. I think I already showed this case. This is the worsening ARDS style uh, patient. Uh, I just want to mention, this was been mentioned by, by Keith Siegel about the risk of, uh, you know, uh, pulmonary emboli uh, in these patients. We know that patients with moderate and severe disease may have an increased risk of thromboembolic advances and described in a few papers. Uh, that includes, of course, PE, uh, pulmonary embolism. And we like to measure the dimers in these patients. And this is an example of a patient, 76 year old, year old female that had also symptoms of COVID-19 and had subsequently a uh, pulmonary embolism as shown in the pictures with ground glass opacities. So I just want to mention also that patients with severe, moderate to severe picture are getting actually prophylactic anticoagulation when they're hospitalized just to prevent this kind of events from happening. I just want to mention, since I'm an abdominal imager, uh, there have been some interest in describing non, uh, you know, upper respiratory symptoms, uh, including uh, GI symptoms. So, uh, for instance, a recent meta-analysis in over 4,000 cases from China showed that about 17 patients, 17% 17 of patients had some form of GI symptoms. Uh, such as, you know, uh, you know, pain, nausea, vomiting, and things like this. And they were able also to show that the viral particles were detected in stool samples in about 40% of cases, 48% uh, of cases. Um, there have been also some publications recently. This is like from this, actually this month, uh, or like early, uh, late uh, April, two uh, U.S. series showed uh, in three and 23 cases that uh, patients with abdominal pain may get chest, uh, I'm sorry, may get abdominal CT, and these patients will have uh, incidental findings on the lung basis. Uh, for instance, this series from, um, uh, from Chicago showed that 23 patients with abdominal pain, among those, 11 patients had no abdominal findings, and the pain was likely related to COVID-19 infection, whether it was related to chest infection or to GI infection is unclear, uh, and only 17 out of 23 had uh, confirmed COVID-19. We actually uh, like to show the slide to summarize the work that uh, my colleague uh, Michael King and, uh, and also Sarah Lewis have put together. Uh, we have looked back at about 60 plus cases with uh, confirmed COVID-19 who had uh, abdominal complaints and uh, who came to the ER and that uh, triggered uh, abdominal CT. And what's interesting was that most of those 62 cases, actually about, I think, 48 uh, had no findings on abdominal CT, but they had incidental findings in the, in the lungs. Um, most of these patients actually were either middle-aged or younger, and about 80% of them had underlying health conditions, such as, you know, overweight, obesity, hypertension, diabetes makes them, you know, at risk. And unfortunately, 80% of them were hospitalized and 90% were discharged. And you can see here the abdominal symptoms consisted in pain uh, in about 80% of cases, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and about half of them. And some of these patients also had respiratory symptoms. And most uh, CT findings were based on the uh, presence of ground glass opacity, in a multifocal and peripheral distribution as described before. Uh, most patients had elevated CRPs, uh, CRP in the blood, increased ferritin, and also the dimer uh, in about 79% of cases. Just want to discuss very briefly differential diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, the findings I described in chest CT are not specific for COVID-19. Uh, some other viral infections may have something similar, similar picture. So that includes SARS. Uh, by the way, SARS is pretty much gone, uh, but MERS has still, you know, comes back from time to time. Uh, this is the Middle Eastern uh, um, uh, 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 infection. Uh, you can see also something similar in the in the flu, viral influenza, uh, adenovirus, RSV, etc. The, the picture is quite different, though, in community-acquired pneumonias, like, you know, uh, bacterial pneumonias, which is really typical. Usually it's a lomar uh, infection. Um, 
it's quite quite different uh, with the distribute you know peripheral distribution, greater ground glass opacity, etc. But however, viral infection can have something similar in appearance, and unfortunately, patients with you know background pulmonary disease may have uh, also something similar like pulmonary edema, uh, ARDS not related to infection, uh, organizing pneumonia, drug toxicity, etc. So there's a whole a whole list of diseases that can have very similar something similar or have some some overlap in appearance with COVID-19. So we have to be very careful there. And um, you know, I'll show you actually an example of reporting um, of chest CT in a few minutes. Um, how does chest CT perform in diagnosing COVID-19? I think it does overall very well. So we know the sensitivity is extremely high, between 72 to 97 percent. Remember that early on the chest CT can be negative. However, the specificity of chest CT is limited. Uh, it has not been assessed in a lot of studies, but in the studies using RT-PCR as the gold standard, it has been ranging between 25 and 56 percent. So, so that's really important to remember that we're not specific enough and we need to rely on the presence of an RT-PCR test that's positive. Um, unfortunately, as you know, uh, RT-PCR is not you know 100 sensitive so there have been there have been cases or instances where the ct is positive showing features suggestive of covid 19 while the diagnosis is not confirmed and it's been described in papers so what do i do in these cases in these cases what is what is suggested is to repeat the rt pcr test within 24 to 48 hours because the sampling may be negative or maybe too early in the disease but it is very important to have a positive diagnosis of COVID-19 to treat the patient as such. And remember also when you're in the peak of the pandemic that of course your performance is going to be extremely high, but in a few weeks from now, there'll be less and less hopefully uh, patients with COVID-19 that you, you need to be even more careful in you know, cataloging somebody as COVID-19 while they may have something else. So the guidelines and position statements, there's a lot of them uh, online, you know, uh, for instance, the uh, ACR, American College of Radiology was probably one of the first ones to recommend, to not recommend the use of CT as a screening tool. That's generally all the North American guidelines, uh, the Society of Thoracic Imaging, uh, same thing for the European Society of Radiology. They said that chest CT should not be performed as a screening tool, especially when you have mild or no symptoms. However, chest CT may have a role in patients with comorbidities when you have somebody with obesity, diabetes, which is unfortunately a lot of, a lot of our population in the US. Um, and I want to show also the, flight, the STR, the Society of Thoracic Radiology position statement dated March 11, 2020. They basically said at this time, the Society of Thoracic Imaging and the American, I think it's American Society of Emergency Radiology do not recommend routine CT screening for diagnosing patients under investigation for COVID-19. You should be restricted to patients who test positive for COVID-19 and who are suspected of having complicating complications such as abscess or MPMA in the, in the, in the lungs. Uh, I just want to mention very briefly also structured reporting. We have been actually adopting this in Mount, at Mount Sinai. Uh, you can fly, classify patients in four categories as um, depending on the appearance and the important, uh, this is important because it decreases variability and increased clarity, especially if you want to do a research study, it will be much easier to just, uh, you know, dig the data. So this is uh, based on a paper uh, published in radiology and thoracic imaging with a panel of, uh, you know, different chest radiologists. So um, typical appearance would be what I described, right? And in the report, you can uh, suggest um, using the wording as shown here. I can read it unfortunately from my screen, but basically uh, you can say uh, this is commonly reported in COVID-19 pneumonia. However, other processes can have the same appearance. And determinate appearance would be when you have a typical features of COVID-19 um, with very, for instance, very few small GGO, no rounded appearance, uh, when you have, for instance, unilateral disease, and then you can say, for instance, that imaging features can be seen with COVID-19, though are non-specific and could occur with a variety of infectious and non-infectious processes. 
Uh, this can be adopted. I mean, this is really free to be adopted, but this is just given as an example. Uh, the other categories would be a typical appearance when you have, for instance, isolated uh, low bar segmental consolidation that can be seen, for instance, in, uh, in uh, bacterial pneumonia. Um, and you can also see that these features are commonly seen in COVID-19 and should be considered in other pneumonias. And you can have also negative features when you have no CT feature to suggest infection. So, uh, and again, if you really want to have a copy of this, it will be in the slide, but it will be also in the paper uh, published uh, in radiology, cardiothoracic imaging. Uh, very briefly, I want to talk about new directions uh, of uh, chest uh, imaging. Uh, important one is radiomics, uh, which is, you know, quantification of uh, texture features uh, and the semantic features uh, on chest CT and also AI. Uh, there's uh, a few papers actually from mostly from China at this point uh, where you know they accumulated a lot of data as you can imagine uh, and I'll just summarize uh, three studies here um, very recent all from 2020 obviously uh, for instance the first study by Chan in European radiology looked at a model combining uh, semantic features meaning you know clinical features um, and uh, for instance extension of disease uh, with uh, radiomics and they found that the combination had excellent performance for diagnosing COVID-19 compared to uh, other infections. So this is more for differential diagnosis. Uh, another study published, well, this is probably one of the first studies published in AI in radiology by Lee et al. Uh, showed that over 4,000 chest CTs from 3,000 patients, a deep learning model demonstrated AUC of 0 0.96 for uh, detecting COVID-19 compared to other infections. This is really almost too good to be true. Uh, should be really validated uh, by other investigators. Uh, an important question about CT features, obviously, would, would be to predict the outcome. Can we really predict what happens at baseline CT? And that's really an important question. And this is uh, in this paper by Liu et al. in Terranostics, where they, it's a small series, about 134, uh, where they try to predict outcome based on percentage of involvement of ground glass opacity, consolidation volume, uh, collected at two separate days at day zero and day four. And they were able to see that the changes between day zero and day four are highly predictive of outcome, meaning does the patient need uh, ventilation, for instance, or, uh, or death. And AUC was 0 0.93, excellent AUC. And also they found that the CT features controlled for age and gender on day four uh, outperformed clinical scores and blood tests alone for predicting outcomes. So this is really very interesting data, uh, but I think we need more data to see whether, you know, either radionics combined with AI uh, are better than just clinical, you know, uh, scores and better than blood tests and also even better than subjective uh, assessment of chest CT by uh, radiologists. Uh, I just want to say one word about radiology preparedness. This is quite a a kind of different subject, but overlaps with my presentation to discuss how you prepare yourself, you know, for as a radiology department to, you know, face this, uh, you know, pandemic of patients coming to the ER. And so during the acute phase, which already passed, thankfully, we're, we're, we're beyond that. Uh, we basically had to shut down all non-essential studies and exams, including non-COVID research. It was clinical cases needing, you know, for elective surgeries, for instance, and things like this, and also non-COVID research was shut down very quickly. Um, we had to immediately, you know, uh, you know, start, you know, uh, protecting patients and workers with PPE, uh, uh, protective equipment, personal protective equipment. We had to deploy this across the board in radiology and non-radiology departments. Uh, and we had to also implement disinfection methods uh, in CAT scans. Initially, it was like uh, 40 minutes and then 10 minutes, and then now it's one minute with some uh, disinfectants that are really hard to find, but we have been lucky to, to have that available. We deployed portable x-ray machines, obviously. Uh, we also asked uh, radiologists to stay at home, uh, and we deployed immediately home, sta home stations for radiologists to minimize non-essential presence. We also immediately switched to e-learning, uh, for uh, residents and e-communication, all the meetings are on, you know, Zoom platforms, for instance. So we've done, 
you know, there's, we do all this social distancing, we don't meet face to face. Uh, so all of that has been implemented very quickly and successfully. Now we are on the other side of the curve with the recovery phase. We started reopening not for non-emergent cases, for cancer cases, we need surgery. We started, we're starting actually officially next week. Uh, we are still practicing social distancing in the waiting area with the waiting room. We have scheduled now one case per hour. Uh, we continue e-learning and e-communication. That's probably gonna stay for a long time. Uh, we're still protecting patients and workers. Uh, we are also reopening progressively research activities uh, in the next two or three weeks. Okay, so just, just to summarize uh, my talk take home messages. So chest CT has typical findings in COVID-19. However, it does lack specificity and we have to be very careful uh, not to you know, catalog everybody as COVID-19. We need to look at the clinical picture. Uh, it's generally not recommended for screening for COVID-19, especially in mild cases. Um, it is important to use chest CT for looking for complications, especially in cases with negative PCR, also in cases with comorbidities, and it's possibly useful to use chastity for uh, predicting uh, outcome. And with this, I'd like to close my presentation. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Taoli. Thank you very much, Bashir, for this informative lecture. And um...